Today we discuss an investing strategy that seeks to cover all of your bases as an investor. Similar to the permanent portfolio, its goal is to perform well in a variety of economic conditions from periods of high inflation to bear and bull markets. However, unlike the permanent portfolio, it also attempts to balance that goal with the desire to achieve solid, risk-adjusted returns. Let's talk about the pinwheel portfolio. But before we get going, be sure to like this video if you haven't already, as it really does help out the channel a lot, and subscribe with notifications on for more money-related videos like this one every single week. And if you want to further support this channel, you can check out some of the links I've left in the description below, which includes a link to the investing platform M1 Finance. Get started investing for free today. So the Pinwheel Portfolio was created by Tyler of PortfolioCharts.com. We've already covered another one of his strategies in the Golden Butterfly Portfolio, and on the whole, it was an allocation that I really, really liked. So I thought it'd be interesting to take a look at another one of his approaches. Like I said, the goal of this allocation seems to be to perform well in a variety of economic environments through diversifying across the four most common asset classes recommended by investment professionals while achieving comparatively good risk-adjusted returns. Those four asset classes are domestic stocks, international stocks, bonds, and real assets, such as gold and real estate. The portfolio splits its money evenly between these four asset classes, but in order to achieve those higher risk-adjusted returns, it also adds what are often referred to in the investing world as tilts to each of those classes. Tilts are simply a subsection of an asset class. For instance, in the stock market, there are large, mid, and small cap stocks. Some portfolios are tilted towards small cap stocks, meaning they invest more money in them than the large or mid cap ones, in order to achieve some goal. Usually in the case of small cap stocks, it's longer term returns, since historically small cap stocks have produced larger long term returns than their counterparts. Investors can also tilt their strategy towards value or growth stocks. The pinwheel portfolio puts 15% of its money towards the four traditional assets, and 10% of its money towards a tilt in each of those four classes classes. In this case, the traditional assets are represented by a total stock market index fund, an international stock market index fund, an intermediate bond fund, and a real estate fund, while its tilts are represented by a small cap value fund, an emerging markets fund, treasury bills, and gold which, depending on who you ask, may or may not be a tilt, but most strategies don't seem to put this much into gold, so I'm going to go with it. So, does this allocation succeed in delivering those solid risk-adjusted returns while performing well in a variety of economic situations? Let's find out. We'll start by analyzing the historical long-term returns of this strategy. To analyze the returns, we'll be looking at a few different metrics. We'll be looking at the long-term 40-year inflation-adjusted returns for every year starting from 1976 through the end of 2019, since that's the first and last years for which I have complete data on all the assets involved in this strategy at the time of this recording. That is a bit different than some of the time frames we've used in other videos in this series, so at the end of this video we'll also give an update on how other strategies we've already covered would have performed during this particular stretch of years so that we can have an apples to apples comparison. Given this strategy's goal, we'll also be looking at its returns on a risk adjusted basis to see if the hopefully excess returns that it's generating over something like the permanent portfolio is actually worth it once volatility is factored in. Related to that, we'll also be taking a look at how many times the portfolio lost money and how severe those losses were. Finally, we'll touch on how dependable or trustworthy the strategy is by examining how sensitive those long-term returns are to when you decide to start investing. So, based on the data I have since 1976, the average 40-year inflation-adjusted return for the pinwheel portfolio is about 6.6% per year. Its worst-case return was about 6.4% per year, assuming you began investing in 1979 or 1980. Its best case scenario was an average return of around 6.8% per year, assuming you began investing in 1976 or 1978. That suggests that a $10,000 investment would grow to, on average, $128,900 over the course of 40 years after adjusting for inflation. At worst, you're looking at a nest egg of around $119,600, and at best, $138,900. Now obviously we have to take those figures with a pretty gigantic grain of salt, since there's only a handful of 40-year time frames available to us since 1976. To compensate for that, we'll take a closer look at the rolling 10-year inflation-adjusted returns in just a minute. But for now, let's look at the risk-adjusted returns. Risk-adjusted returns are usually represented by a sharp ratio, which measures how much more return you're getting compared to a theoretically risk-free investment like treasury bills for the volatility that you're taking on. 
Some will also look at the Sortino ratio, which measures how much more return you're getting for the downside volatility that you're taking on. So basically the same thing as the Sharpe ratio, except we're only concerning ourselves with volatility when our investments are not earning as much as a risk-free investment did. The pinwheel portfolio has a Sharpe ratio of 0.6 during this time frame, which places it well ahead of the permanent portfolio and behind only the Larry portfolio and Golden Butterfly among the strategies we've covered so far in this series. It also posts a Sortino ratio ratio of 1.42. However, this actually ranks fifth among the strategies that we've covered so far, behind the Larry Portfolio, Golden Butterfly, Classic 6040, and Permanent Portfolio. This suggests that while it does do a solid job of delivering risk-adjusted returns when overall volatility is measured, when we specifically look at how volatile the pinwheel portfolio is when things are not going well, it does falter a little bit more relative to something like the Permanent Portfolio or those other strategies. Now, let's take a look at some volatility metrics. The average standard deviation of returns for the pinwheel portfolio was 10.4%, which means that in any given year, we can expect that most of our returns will fall somewhere between negative 3.8% and 17% with this strategy. And just like with any of the strategies, there will occasionally be some exceptions where the returns fall outside of our expected range, for better or worse. In this case, roughly 68% of our returns fell within our expected range. There was a total of 10 years out of a possible 44 where the portfolio failed to keep pace with inflation in this sample. That's a loss frequency of around 23%. Thankfully, the majority of those down years were recovered from really quickly, as there wasn't a single 10-year stretch where the strategy failed to keep pace with inflation. And it never really came particularly close to losing money, with its worst rolling 10-year inflation-adjusted return coming in at 3.6% per year between 2007 and 2017. That stretch was one of only two instances where the rolling returns was less than 4%. The other was from 1999 to 2009. Now I get that this data set only goes back to 1976, which means we're missing out on quite a few major events, most notably the first downturn in the 1970s and the Great Depression. But it is still good to see the strategy managed to keep its head above water during some pretty notable downturns. Its median and average 10-year inflation-adjusted returns were 6.7% per year. Its best 10-year run was from 1984 to 1994, when it returned 9.6% per year above inflation. Additionally, there was only one time that this strategy failed to beat inflation more than one year in a row. That was from 2001 to 2003, where it trailed inflation by 2%, 1%, and 5% respectively. In 2004, it rose by an inflation-adjusted 25% to set a new all-time high. Next, let's talk about start date sensitivity. Start date sensitivity, at least as we're measuring it in this series, takes a look at the rolling returns of the 10 years prior to each initial investment date and compares it to the rolling returns of the following 10 years to see how big of a difference there is between the two. It's a good way to get an idea of how dependable or trustworthy an investment's returns have been historically. And ideally, we want to keep our total start date sensitivity, measured here by the difference between the largest underperforming decade and the largest overperforming decade as low as possible. The pinwheel portfolio had a total start date sensitivity of 7.5% during this stretch of years. The largest overperformance was 3.2%, which took place from 2003 to 2013. In those years, the pinwheel strategy had an inflation-adjusted return of 8.1% per year, beating out the returns from 1993 to 2003 of 4.9% per year. The largest underperformance was negative 4.3% per year, when the returns from 1994 to 2004 failed to match those returns produced from 1984 to 1994. But that just about wraps up our analysis of the strategy's returns. Now, let's move on to our crash analysis. A crash analysis is important to do for any investing strategy you're looking at because it's important to know that if you're going to be putting your life savings into something, that you'll be able to weather the storms when they come, financially and otherwise. In these videos, we look at a few different metrics when analyzing the crashes. They are how deep the crash got at its worst, how quickly the strategy typically recovered from those crashes to reach new highs, and the ulcer index, which largely combines the other two metrics into a single number. The deepest crash for the pinwheel portfolio was the Great Recession. However, the longest one was actually the dot-com crash. The Great Recession saw a 23.5% drop between January 2008 and January 2009. However, with growth of 23% and 14% over the next two years, it didn't take too long to recover. The dot-com crash saw drops of 2%, 1%, and 5% between 2001 and 2003, and as I said earlier, it grew by 25% in 2004, setting a new all-time high. So that crash lasted for three years. Interestingly, those were the only 
only two notable downturns. There was a 9% drop in 1982, a 13% drop in 1991, and a 7% drop in 2019, but all three were fully recovered from by the start of the following year. Even this most recent downturn didn't last long. Between January and March, the strategy fell by as much as 17% after adjusting for inflation, but it recovered fully by November. So all things considered, that isn't half bad. And this is reflected in the strategy's ulcer index, which during this time rose to as high as 0.4, but on average hovered around 0.2. With that being said, let's move on to examining the strategy in regards to financial independence. Historically speaking, the pinwheel strategy would have maintained minimum safe withdrawal rates of 6.34% over any 30-year stretch and 6.57% over any 40-year stretch from 1976 through 2019. The worst year to retire using this strategy was 1990 for the 30-year stretch, and 1980 for the 40-year stretch, which is a tad concerning given what happened in 2020. So we'll have to see if these rates continue to drop lower in the near future, or if they can bounce back. I should note that as usual, due to the varying nature of individual expense ratios and tax situations, neither has been considered in these withdrawal rates. The median rates were 7.58% and 7.22% for the 30 and 40 year scenarios respectively, and the maximum rates for the same durations was 8.6% set in 1985 and 7.45% set in 1976. The strategy would have maintained a minimum perpetual withdrawal rate of 5.29%, and as usual for this series, I'm defining perpetual withdrawal rate as the highest withdrawal rate that you could have had while still maintaining your original principle all the way through to the end of the data set, after adjusting for inflation. The accumulation phase of financial independence is where you're still putting money away for your future. The primary metrics here is what percentage of our income are we saving, how do our expenses change over time, how long do we plan to be retired, and how long would it take us to reach financial independence based on that information and the performance of our investing strategy. Assuming our expenses changed in line with inflation and we were planning on a 30-year retirement, while saving 15% of our income we would still be waiting to reach financial independence using the pinwheel strategy, regardless of what year we started investing. But with a 30% savings rate, a hypothetical investor would have reached financial independence independence in 17 of the 44 scenarios. On average, achieving FI with this strategy and at this level of savings took about 30 years. The fastest was 26 years starting in 1982, and the slowest was 36 years starting in 1977. With a 50% savings rate, a hypothetical investor would have reached financial independence in 31 of the 44 scenarios. On average, achieving FI with this strategy and at this level of savings took about 14 and a half years. The fastest was 12 years starting in 1995, and the slowest was 18 years starting in 1976 or 1978. And finally, with an absolutely crazy 70% savings rate, the numbers improve even further with a hypothetical investor reaching financial independence in 39 of the 44 scenarios. On average, achieving FI with this strategy and at this level of saving took about 6 years. The fastest was 5 years starting in 1982, 2001, 2002, or 2008, and the slowest was 10 years starting in 1976. So on your screen now, you'll see the updated return figures for the All Stock, Classic 6040, Permanent Portfolio, No Brainer, Merriman Ultimate Strategy, Larry Portfolio, and Golden Butterfly since 1976. What we notice is that the overall returns of the pinwheel strategy are quite similar to the classic 60-40 strategy or the no-brainer portfolio. However, it depends significantly less on luck to achieve those returns than either of those two strategies did, with a start date sensitivity of just 7.5% which actually slots it in just ahead of the Larry portfolio and behind the Golden Butterfly and Permanent portfolios for the third best mark during this stretch of years. Its volatility metrics were also in the same general ballpark as the classic 60-40 strategy. However, it was less likely to lose money to inflation during this stretch of years, with 10 years failing to keep pace with inflation compared to the 12 for the classic 60-40 approach. However, it doesn't quite perform well enough to put itself in the top tier along with strategies like the Golden Butterfly and, to a lesser extent, the Larry Portfolio, both of which had similar amounts of down years but never trailed inflation by 10% or more in any of those years. The Pinwheel Portfolio trailed inflation by at least 10% on two occasions, one of which was that 23% drop in 2009. On the bright side, it did show very impressive levels of resiliency, with its longest crash duration lasting only three years, a mark that we've only seen bested by the Golden Butterfly portfolio during this stretch of time in the series. So overall, a solid strategy in terms of volatility. 
As far as investing for financial independence goes, the pinwheel portfolio trades blows with the Merriman Ultimate strategy. Both reached financial independence 39 times with a 70% savings rate. The Merriman approach has an edge at the 50% rate with 32 successes compared to the pinwheel's 31, but the pinwheel has a similar edge at the 30% rate with 17 successes compared to the Merriman's 16. The pinwheel portfolio has the second fastest average time to financial independence using both the 30 and 50% savings rates, trailing only the Merriman approach. And at 6.4 years, it has the fastest average time to FI under a 70% savings rate, again narrowly beating out the Merriman strategy. As far as maintaining your lifestyle once you've reached financial independence, it shot right past the golden butterfly and posted the second best 30-year minimum safe withdrawal rate during this stretch of years, trailing only the all-stock portfolio. Its 40-year minimum safe withdrawal rate did fall a bit in the rankings, but was still very respectable, finishing behind the Merriman Ultimate Portfolio and No-Brainer Strategy. Its perpetual withdrawal rate was closer to middle of the pack, so it'll be interesting to see if, in a few years when we have enough data to look back and get a 50-year minimum safe withdrawal rate for this strategy, where it'll end up ranking. So in the end, does the pinwheel strategy accomplish its goals? Well, going by what Tyler, its creator, says on the subject, it does seem to accomplish them reasonably well. It doesn't lose money all that often, and when it does, it typically trails inflation by 10% or less. Notably, during the high inflation period of the late 1970s and early 1980s, the strategy didn't show much sign of a struggle. And while during the recessions of the 2000s there was a bit more of a struggle, it wasn't quite as much as we've seen from many other strategies in this series. Its average returns may not top the charts, but they are solid enough and its risk-adjusted returns, especially as measured by the Sharpe ratio, are very good. Also, when looked at individually, as opposed to viewing 40-year windows, its baseline returns are very strong, trailing actually only the golden butterfly. So in years where the portfolio underperforms its expectations, but isn't totally getting destroyed, it typically performs better than most of the other strategies we've seen so far. And in all other years, it's solid, but not spectacular. To me, this suggests that the pinwheel portfolio does manage to do well in a variety of economic environments, even if it isn't the absolute best in all of them. I also like that it manages to do this with some international diversification, something that most of these strategies, including Tyler's other creation, the Golden Butterfly, doesn't have as much of. But that doesn't mean that the approach isn't without its flaws. No approach is. Beyond its middling historical return figures, it utilizes at least eight different funds, which could make the portfolio a little more unruly to manage, assuming that you can find the requisite funds to invest in in the first place, as many 401k plans in particular offer somewhat limited investment options. So if that's where all of your investments are going, it may be difficult to assemble this particular portfolio. Tyler has also mentioned that in his experience, some investors find it difficult to invest so much money into gold. And while this strategy doesn't put 20 or 25% of its money towards gold, like the Golden Butterfly and Permanent Portfolio does, 10% can still seem like a large chunk to invest into something that doesn't produce an income and can sometimes fail to appreciate for decades at a time. For instance, in 1980, gold was trading at around $675. It would fall to under $500 the following year and not reach that $675 mark again until May 2006. And that's without adjusting for inflation over that time. If we had adjusted for inflation, gold would actually still be trying to recover here in 2020. Now, it's not unheard of for an investment class to spend many years treading water. Stocks have done it on multiple occasions as well, most notably during the Great Depression, but unlike gold, stocks often do provide some sort of income through dividends, which can help to offset some of that feeling of treading financial water. Despite that, Tyler does feel that gold, as a part of a larger investing strategy, can help to balance out the volatility of other assets. He says that he views it kind of like investment insurance. It may not be the primary driver of your wealth, but you'll be glad you have it when things get really bad and all other asset classes are struggling. That topic is probably a video in and of itself, but given that the pinwheel portfolio, the golden butterfly, and the permanent portfolio are all fairly dependable strategies based on the historical data we have, it might be something worth looking into. But what do you think? Let me know in the comments section below. But that'll do it for me today. Once again, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to smash that like button if you haven't already, subscribe, and hit that bell next to my name so you'll be notified of all my future uploads. I generally upload every single Monday, and if you have a friend that would be interested in this kind of content, be sure to share it with them. Let's really get this information out there and start our own financial revolution.